Details about the Garden of Eden many don't know. Number 1. What is the location of the Garden of Eden? There are various mysteries in the Bible. However, a popular question that many ask is, what is the location of the Garden of Eden? To answer this question, we will need to do some forensics. To begin, let us consult the Holy Scriptures. Eden was the name of a region of the earth when God first created the world. The Hebrew word translated Eden is taken to mean pleasure or delight. In this area, God planted a garden. In this location, God fellowshiped with the first man, and the two of them had a close connection with one another. It was planned and planted by none other than God himself. Second, is that it was the first home of mankind. Thirdly, it was a place with a great deal of variety, with all kinds of trees. The only thing the Bible tells us concerning the Garden of Eden's location is found in Genesis chapter 2 verses 10 to 14. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon, it flows around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. The delium and the onyx stone are there as well. The name of the second river is Gihon. It flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. According to the Bible, the area has four rivers and abundant resources, including fine gold and gemstones. There is no exact knowledge of the identities of the Pishon and Gihon rivers. However, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers are well known. The key area in the map of the Middle East is what geographers call the Fertile Crescent. The band of fertile land which stretches from the River Nile in Egypt in the west northeast through the land of Israel, and then south and southeast to the plains surrounding the rivers Tigris and Euphrates, in what used to be called Mesopotamia, which means the middle of the rivers, Meso-Middle and Potamia rivers. If the Tigris and Euphrates rivers mentioned in the Bible are the same rivers that are known by those names today, then the Garden of Eden must have been located in the Middle East. However, even a modest flood in a localized area can alter the path that a river takes, and the flood that occurred during Noah's time was more than just a localized flood. We know modern rivers today, such as the Tigris or Euphrates, because Noah and his sons named some rivers in the post-flood world after familiar pre-flood rivers. The Earth's topography underwent a dramatic transformation as a result of the flood. As a direct consequence of this, the precise location of the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers is unknown. It may be that the contemporary rivers called the Tigris and Euphrates are merely named after those connected with Eden. People have spent decades, if not centuries, looking for the Garden of Eden, but they have not been successful. Many places have staked the claim to being the original site of Eden but nobody really knows for sure where it was. What happened to the Garden of Eden? The Bible does not explicitly say. During the flood, there is a good chance that the garden was utterly destroyed. Number two, a new Eden. So if we cannot locate the former Garden of Eden, the great question we should ask ourselves is whether we will ever experience another Eden. A new Eden, you may say. As a result of our restored relationship with God through Jesus Christ, we have access to the eternal garden of God. This assurance was so valuable to Jesus that it cost him something. The one who laid down his life for us has defeated the serpent and opened paradise. Revelation chapter 2 verse 7. The one who has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
To the one who overcomes, I will grant to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. For these overcomers, Eden is a promise of restoration and eternal life. This was meant first in the eternal sense of making it to heaven, which was no small promise to a church threatened with the removal of Jesus' presence. It is also meant to see the effects of the curse rolled back in our lives through walking in Jesus' redeeming love. A river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, is described as being in the New Jerusalem. This river flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Revelation chapter 22 verses 1 through 3 And he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bond servants will serve him. The Bible starts with the tree of life, which man was not authorized to devour, after the sin at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now we see the tree of life again. It's hard to visualize this divine landscaping. John may depict a large street with a river flowing down the middle and a large tree, or sequence of trees, that grows with roots on either side of the river. The visual picture presented is that the river of life flows down through the middle of the city, and the tree is large enough to span the river, so that the river is in the midst of the street, and the tree is on both sides of the river. Seeing the tree of life again suggests a restoration of all things. Now, at last, almost at the end of the great drama of the Bible, man may return and legitimately enjoy the blessing which he was banished for illegitimately desiring. Number 3. Two Divine Trees Existed Inside In the Garden of Eden, God made all kinds of trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. Genesis chapter 2 verse 9 Out of the ground, the Lord God caused every tree to grow that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. How would you like to be in such a paradise? Beautiful trees are all around you. Fruits are ready for you to pick any time you feel hungry. Meanwhile, continuing verse 9, two unique trees were placed in the middle of the garden. These were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God put the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden to give Adam and Eve a choice to obey him or disobey him. They were free to do anything they wanted except eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Genesis chapter 2 verses 16 through 17 The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For on the day that you eat from it, you will certainly die. If God had not provided Adam and Eve with the ability to make their own decisions, they would have been functionally identical to robots, who would have simply carried out the instructions written into their software. Adam and Eve were created by God as free beings, able to make their own decisions. For Adam and Eve to indeed be free, they had to have a choice. The act of disobedience was spiritually deleterious. Because they didn't listen to God, corruption came into their lives and into the world. God already knew what would happen because of sin. The results, evil, sin, suffering, sickness, and death, have plagued the world ever since. Since then, the world has been full of evil, 
sin, pain, sickness, and death. Because of what Adam and Eve did, everyone is born with a sinful nature or a tendency to sin. Because of what Adam and Eve decided, Jesus Christ had to die on the cross and shed his blood for us. The tree of life mentioned in the books of Genesis and Revelation is a life-giving tree created to enhance and perpetually sustain the physical life of humanity. God placed the tree in the Garden of Eden. The centrally located tree of life would have been easily accessible to Adam and Eve from any point in the garden. More details concerning the tree of life come after Adam and Eve's sin. Genesis chapter 3 verse 22 Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now, he might reach out with his hand and take fruit also from the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Adam lost his eternal life because he didn't listen to God. The tree of life had a part to play in maintaining the life of Adam and Eve. Adam would have lived forever if he had eaten from the tree of life. He would have spent all of eternity in a cursed world. It was a mercy that God kept us from the tree of life. By making it hard to get to the tree of life, God showed compassion. God knew that because of sin, Life on earth would be hard and sad, so he gave people only a certain number of years to live. To live eternally in a sinful state would mean endless agony for humanity, with no hope. By putting a limit on our lives, God gives us enough time to come to know him and his provision for eternal life through Christ but spares us the misery of an endless existence in a sinful condition. Number 4. The Angel That Guarded the Tree of Life Are cherubs mentioned in the Bible? Do you visualize adorable baby faces when you hear the word cherub? Some stone cherubs have been made and put throughout the gardens for tourists to admire. Cherubs are referenced in the Bible and play significant roles. Cherubs are angels who execute divine functions in the earthly domain. A cherub is also defined as a second-order angel whose gift is knowledge. Cherubim are frequently depicted in art as children with wings. The representation relies heavily on the appearance of innocence. Innocent, but powerful. Cherubs are depicted in Middle Eastern art as lions or bulls with eagle wings and a human face, according to academics. Although the Bible does not contain a list of angelic orders, some scholars view cherubim to be among the highest. The Old Testament first mentions cherubim. After Adam sinned, the Lord judged his acts and forced him to leave the garden. Genesis chapter 3 verses 23 through 24. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. God provided instructions. Adam disobeyed God. He was forced to leave, and the Garden of Eden's entrance was closed off from re-entry. This scripture emphasizes the significance of the cherubs as God's protectors, guardians, and creatures. Cherubims are not childlike creatures. Angels were depicted as children by artists during the Renaissance period, according to historians. Scholars further claim that the word cherub was derived from the Hebrew cherub and the Aramaic karabia, which means childlike. This serves as a reminder that certain terms change over time in diverse ways. Cherubim is the plural of cherub. What do cherubim look like in the Bible? The cherubs are described in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. And in the fire was what looked like four living creatures 
in appearance, their form was human. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 5 Scripture depicts the faces of cherubim. Ezekiel communicated that the appearance of the creatures possessed four faces and four wings. He conveyed that fire moved among the creatures. Precise facts of Ezekiel's encounter are told in Ezekiel chapter 1 verses 5 through 14. And within it there were figures resembling four living beings, and this was their appearance. They had human form. Each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, and their feet were like a calf's hoof, and they sparkled like polished bronze. Under their wings on their four sides were human hands. As for the faces and wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn when they moved. Each went straight forward. As for the form of their faces, each had a human face. All four had the face of a lion on the right and the face of a bull on the left, and all four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Each had two touching another being, and two covering their bodies. And each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go, without turning as they went. In the midst of the living beings, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches moving among the living beings. The fire was bright, and lightning was flashing from the fire, and the living beings ran back and forth like bolts of lightning. Each description of the Bible teaches us something new about God. These evocative descriptions may conjure up images from recent films or television shows. Each detail mentioned in the Bible has been given to us to remind us of God's majesty and greatness as well as the majesty and glory of his creations. Many painters prefer to depict the cherubim's looks as baby-like rather than the precise depiction in scripture. The total number of cherubim created by God is unknown. Four are mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 5, Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 9, and Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 12. Many creative renderings of them were employed in the tabernacle and Solomon's temple embellishments. The widespread ornamental use of cherubs throughout Israel's sacred structures, together with a plural form of cherub, would argue for the likelihood of a plethora of these creatures. Function The evidence for the cherubim's function can be divided into three categories. Number 1. Guardians Following Adam and Eve's expulsion from the Garden of Eden, God erected cherubim and a blazing spinning sword to guard the path to the Tree of Life. Number 2. Associated with Fire In his vision, Ezekiel saw God, the cherubim, and the throne chariot as a storm cloud with lightning and a rainbow. Coals of fire were visible between the cherubim and the holy chariot's wheels. Burning coals were gathered from there and strewn over Jerusalem in judgment. Number 3. Bearers of God's Throne Chariot Yahweh was described as the one who was enthroned on the cherubim because God revealed himself to Moses from between the two cherubim set at opposing ends of the Ark of the Covenant's mercy seat. Cherubim which have strong symbolic meanings, were utilized in connection with Israel's religious architecture. They were included in the design of the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle at the direction of God. They were used in the ornamentation of Solomon's temple. Cherubim were also depicted in Ezekiel's vision of the Millennial Temple. 